Uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, so this is the first uh, multi party debate that we have. Uh, we're excited to host uh, this first debate from the multi party uh, working group, the young uh, multi party working group, uh, made from PhD students like myself and postdoctoral researchers like um, my co-moderate, Alex Tapichet. And basically in this debate, uh, as you know, we'll discuss uh, Alucanuma, which is, uh, <laughs> maybe we should have read a bit more now, I think, uh, which is this first uh, AD treatment that we have uh, that has been approved for FDA. We'll have a bit of the story, uh, how this will work or how we thought that this could be working. That first I do this presentation, then Alexa will introduce a bit the topic and our uh, debaters here, uh, pro and against uh, this treatment. And then later, uh, Ruben will start uh, with his uh, with his arguments, uh, why he's uh, thinking, why he thinks like that. Then uh, Nicholas will do his, uh, his part, and then we will uh, have rebuttal. So the, um, Ruben will uh, will continue um, co uh, counter argumenting what has been said before, and the same with Nicholas. And then later we will open for discussion with everyone, so we can have a bit open audience. Uh, we can ask questions, give your opinion and hopefully you can engage in a nice discussion uh, about uh, Alzheimer's treatment, which uh, we think is uh, really important nowadays to talk about this. So, I'm off for now, so please, Alexa, whenever you want. We'll start. Great. Uh, first, before we start, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I know there's a lot of people very familiar with uh, Alzheimer's disease here, but um, yeah, to make sure it will be easier for the debate. So, of course, I think probably all of you know at least the clinical presentation of AD, right? We have progressive cognitive decline of the memories affected first, and then you have uh, impairment of activities of daily living. But it's really a clinical pathological entity. There are uh, key proteins that are defining the disease that starts to accumulate in the brain. So we have uh, amblyopia plaques, of course. This will be <laughs> the main topic of today. We also have uh, tau pathology, which then leads to uh, neuronal loss or, or atrophy in the brain. And the idea is that these pathological features start to occur um, or to accumulate in the brain over a very long period. And there's a lot of studies that have been done over the years. This is one example of the, the, the pathways that we think is happening. A lot of you have probably seen these slides too often if you're uh, in the, the field. But we really, a lot of us at least, or I don't know, not to want to make an editorial comment, but uh, it's a well accepted. Um, pathway of events that a lot of people believe will start with amblyopia. Of course, this can be maybe a topic for another debate even, but let's say uh, today we'll focus a lot on this amblyopia that maybe starts this cascade which then follows by tau degeneration and then only then cognitive decline is affected. And so changes in amblyopia are really happening very early on in this disease process and it's been a key target in many clinical trials over the years and many have failed, except, well, we'll see if you think it failed or not, <laughs> this uh, So the idea is like, uh, there may be 15 uh, compounds here, um, spanning again almost 20 years uh, of research, and it is really only this last one that has been uh, recently accepted under much controversy. So I think the whole um, idea of also how uh, this drug was approved now, or conditionally approved, uh, has been very interesting. So regardless of uh, what's your background, I think it's quite an interesting story and it can make us think more broadly about what could be a good treatment or not. So we don't just need to think about only Adjikanma when we discuss later on. Um, and I know, I think both uh, uh, debaters will actually go a bit in the story of how um, the clinical trials that led to this um, fast approval by the FDA. So I will leave that for the debate. Uh, and now I'll introduce our debaters. We're super lucky to have um, Ruben Smith and Niklas Martin Kalbrand who agreed today. And uh, they are the perfect persons to talk about this. They are both uh, neurologists and researchers with extensive experience with uh, biomarkers, so uh, Amblin, of, of course. So they really have uh, these two views, let's say, to um, critique or at least uh, have insight into the, how the trials went and how this can really affect the the, their, 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 how they treat the patients um, as clinicians. So with that, let's start with uh, Ruben, who will tell us uh, the pro side. Well, I need to see the slides, actually. 
No. All right. So my name is Ruben Smith, and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to this discussion. I was asked to, to present uh, the pro side of the Adekanama uh, story, and uh, I chose to, to entitle it Adekanama, A New Hope. <laughs> and uh, uh, I should say ju just uh, uh, that I'm unfortunately also on call, so there might be calls <laughs> to me that I need to answer, but I hope, I hope not. But if it happens, then, then you don't know why. Uh, all right, so Adekanama, A New Hope. A new hope. And then I chose this picture to to uh, to show uh, my view of of of, of uh, the pre what previously was associated to an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, the type of despair that you would you would get, get from from receiving a diagnosis that you know is what will affect your your memory, your personality, uh, your well your uh, interactions with, your, with the rest of the world and that, that there is no treatment. And with, with this in, in mind, I think that Atikanumab then offers a very good, a very good, uh, uh, well, it, it, it offers a change from, from this view, that's something that leads away from, from this, this feeling of despair. And again, g coming back to, to what uh, Alexa presented earlier on, this is just another, uh, another version of the same figure from, from uh, Cliff Jack et al. from the last neurology, showing that, uh, at least according to the amyloid, uh, amyloid decay hypothesis, uh, the disease starts with accumulation of, uh, of a beta that can first be measured as a decrease of CSF A beta 42 in CSF, and that then it's re relatively rapidly followed by an increase in amyloid PET signal and then by accumulation or an increase in the uh, phosphorylated tau and then by tau PET by uh, MRI changes in cognitive, cognitive impairments. So then it was, oh, unfortunately this one is a bit, uh, oh, let's just put it down there instead. Uh, so then, this this uh, study was a pivotal study that was that was published in September two thousand and sixteen in Nature, where they show that uh, the aducanumab antibody reduces a beta plaques in in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So shown here on the, to the left are the baseline scans, and then uh, the scans after one year to the right after in, in patients having received either placebo on top and then in increasing those of aducanumab. And as you can see, there is a really clear and a nice dose-dependent uh, reduction of the A-beta found in the brain of these patients. This is the same data, but then just quantified. Uh, this was the basis for why uh, uh, the Engage and Emer uh, Emerge studies uh, were, were started and they, they started in 2015 so basically before the, this, this study was published but I guess they already knew the data by then. These two studies have, uh, were then, were then uh, run for th approximately three years, they were supposed to run for longer but uh, the results are pu published in, the, in this paper, it was published last year or actually this year they were presented last year, but uh, published this year in the Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease by Bad Heberleintal. And the reason for them being, being uh, halted after futility analysis was actually, as they claim in this article, based on, on a faulty futility analysis. They merged the two pretty big studies of about 1,500 people in, in each, and they merged the data into one and saw that, well, there's no effect on. Uh, of, of the studies, and then the studies were halted prematurely. Once they then analyzed all the data that was in there, that is also the data that had been collected after the futility analysis, what could be seen was, I'll move this one again, was, oh sorry, that uh, at least in the eMERGE study, there is a clear beneficial effect of, a, of aducanumab treatment High, more effect in the high dose than in the low dose, but at least uh, there is a dose-dependent effect uh, with a reduction in the increase in CDR. And CDR is, is a, a scale that measures, um, that, may, that weighs uh, uh, 
clinical uh, clinical dementia rating uh, that weighs uh, uh, activities of daily life and then clinical uh, parameters into some uh, into, into some uh, weighted uh, score and a reduction in this score indicates then that the dementia progresses more uh, uh, or uh, less rapidly. Unfortunately, the engaged study didn't show the same results. So there are two, now two studies that are about similar size, but one shows, shows a clear effect and the other one shows uh, no effect, or at least in the high dose, the low dose uh, shows a uh, trend for an effect, but, but for the high dose there's no effect. In both these studies, however, uh, as in the Nature paper, they show a very clear uh, target engagement and the, the, a beta that is uh, accumulating in the brain is then rapidly reduced by the treatment in a dose-dependent manner. And interestingly, in, in a sub-analysis uh, of, of, uh, of these studies, they show that not only does the a beta go away, but also phosphorylated tau, that is then supposed to be a later marker of Alzheimer's disease, it continues to increase in the placebo group, as you can see in the gray, the gray lines here, but in both in the emerging and engaged studies, but it decreases uh, in the, in the uh, in a dose of work sort of in a dose-dependent manner. I don't think these are statistically significant, but at least they, they both are uh, significantly different from the placebo group. So it seems that the phospho tau, that is then an indication of, of, of uh, the tau accumulation, that, that, that is also reduced by these treatments. And when cor correlating these, uh, uh, the phospho tau results to the efficacy, you, you can see that, that the more phospho tau is reduced, uh, that is then correlated to beneficial, a beneficial outcome. Uh, of the uh, CBR uh, sum of boxes, of the MMS and also, also of the other cognitive tests in, in, the, uh, in the studies. And this is then true for both emerging and engaged studies. So it seems that, that, that at least in the patients that have an effect, where we see an effect, there is also effect, an effect of the, the cognitive measures. Now, so what, what, what I wanted to propose is that uh, for these studies, uh, with the patients that were recruited were actually almost a bit later on into the MCI early dementia stage. And if you would then reduce uh, A beta and, and CSF tau in, in this stage, maybe it might be too late for, for, uh, for uh, these patients to really, uh, to, to really benefit from the treatment. And if we were to, to instead treat patients with it, uh, biologically verified AD at an earliest time point, then maybe we will also have run a chance or stand a chance of, of seeing an effect on, on the on the uh, MRI and FTG path and cognition at a later time point. Okay, so uh, as as uh, Gandalf the White appearing when all hope seems to be lost, uh, Adjukanov seems to step out as, as a treatment that might might uh, have a beneficial effect uh, for the patients with AD. And thank, with that, I'd like to thank say thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ruben, uh, for your uh, arguments uh, in favor of Uh Now, Nicholas will get the chance uh, to say his part as well, uh, stating actually the contrary. Uh, why does he think that Adokanumab should not uh, move forward? So, you have the room, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to uh, be here and uh, take part of this debate. And uh, thank you to Ruben for uh, having, taking the, uh, you know, the other side here. I think that uh, in reality, uh, Ruben and I are, are probably more sort of aligned uh, than uh, what our views here may, uh, may look like, but it's, uh, it's good fun, all of it. Uh, so now it's time for the, the harsh truth of uh, the Adekanumab story and uh, you know, you shall despair <laughs> and feel a lot of disappointment like this, like this guy there. Okay, so how can we actually know if Adekanumab or any drug targeting beta amyloid uh, really works? Um, I'll remove this uh, one as well. Um, well, this is a... Uh, um, like a um, hallmark uh, slide, I think, to show sort of 
different potential trajectories of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease in response to, to uh, different uh, treatment options. So um, Alzheimer's disease is a relentless disease uh, which, uh, uh, which has, uh, is characterized by progressive uh, cognitive decline and, and loss of uh, independence and, uh, and, and functions. Uh, so uh, if left untreated, uh, you could expect uh, on average a deterioration as uh, seen in the, in the yellow arrow here. Um, currently available uh, medications uh, uh, work on some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and uh, could be expected on average to give a result such as in the, in the red arrow here with you know, even a potential sort of transient improvement initially, um, uh, but then uh, a disease progression which uh, overall follows the same slope as the natural course of the disease and the effects of these symptomatic treatments uh, won't last forever. Um, and if, if removed, uh, you sort of uh, uh, resume the trajectory of the untreated population. So that's sort of what we have today. Um, so what people are really after is disease modification. And you can think of sort of two um, you know, um, goals here, uh, where the most ambitious would be sort of to uh, achieve disease modification arrest, um, where there is no more progression of disease. That's seen in the, in the green arrow. Uh, but it would probably be acceptable also if we could just achieve disease modification with deceleration of the rate of decline because to, a little bit cynic maybe, but um, um, our patients with Alzheimer's disease are on average quite old. So if we can just delay um, the um, uh, rate of decline with a few years, it would have an enormous impact on, um, on the prevalence of severe cognitive impairment in our societies. Um, to be frank, because people are so old so that they would just have a, a high risk of, uh, of passing away from some other cause. Uh, before reaching a sort of a severe cognitive impairment from Alzheimer's disease. So disease modification with deceleration is certainly a, a very attractive goal. There may be some people that are, are visionary uh, and could even, you know, think of ways to sort of revert up to baseline to have sort of a, a positive slope on their, on their trajectories. But I think that's sort of very much a utopic scenario. Um, so this is, we would look for those sort of uh, uh, trajectories uh, uh, from a new drug. And uh, well, well, how would we know if a drug, uh, a new drug, has this sort of effect uh, on cognition in Alzheimer's disease? Um, well, either you know we could uh, uh, we could do something like this guy in the cartoon here. You know, we could uh, uh, perhaps pick a little bit of those experiments that sort of seem to work out quite well, and we can find reasons why not to believe in the other experiments. And uh, you know, the things can look very really nice and. People used to do this for you know, several thousand years probably, until um, a team of British researchers uh, developed a method called uh, randomized controlled trials. And uh, uh, this is the first example of a published randomized controlled trial uh, where uh, they um, uh, actually randomized uh, uh, streptomycin um, or placebo to patients with pulmonary tuberculosis and found a good effect of the treatment. Um, when used in a blind fashion. Um, and after, this has proven to be a tremendously powerful method for uh, medical research and uh, is uh, you know, the, the foundation upon which we sort of build uh, our uh, modern clinical practice. We rely on randomized controlled trials to say if something was uh, working or not and uh, instead of being just driven by the expectations and hopes of the investigators and the patients. So that's really what we rely on. Um, now, uh, Adukanumab has had really a bumpy road, sort of a roller coaster road. And uh, uh, Ruben outlined some of, um, some of the history, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into some of the details maybe here. So, originally, the, the antibody was derived from, uh, in a very smart and clever way, from, from individuals who were not patients. They were cognitively normal elderly. So it was assumed that uh, these individuals had some sort of innate uh, defense against Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, antibodies against uh, beta amyloid were isolated from these individuals and, uh, and used for uh, development of uh, a therapeutic. Um, 
the first study was the one that uh, Ruben showed data from uh, on, uh, on Amnod PET. It was a prime study with 166 individuals. And um, this was successful on, uh, on Amnod PET, so really showed target engagement. If you use this drug on individuals, the amyloid signal in the brain with PET would go down. Um, this was shown in 2015 at a, a conference, uh, and it was like this uh, uh, really exciting atmosphere where everyone you know, felt that, okay, the tide is turning on Alzheimer's disease now. Although um, a lot of patients uh, had um, uh, imaging abnormalities called area as a result of treatment. And uh, this is especially prevalent if you're, if you're E4 positive, APO E4 positive. And it's often symptomatic also, which is problematic because that uh, will um, interfere with blinding, right? Because if you, uh, if after taking the drug that you experience a lot of dizziness and headaches and um, you know, your doctor becomes very worried and you do a lot of extra MRs, uh, there is a high likelihood that you actually had uh, active treatment. So it will unmask blinding to both you and the treating physician. Um, anyway, uh, effects on amyloid PET were there. So um, uh, these uh, large phase three trials were started, engaged and emerged with about 3,000 individuals in total. And then, bam, uh, four years later, uh, there uh, was this press release uh, that, uh, no, unfortunately, we're going to stop it all because uh, we did a futility analysis after including about 50% of the patients. And this futility analysis showed that um, the likelihood of these uh, trials being successful is very low. It's actually too low for Biogen, the company, um, uh, to, uh, to keep putting you know, in uh, billions of dollars into this project. So they just stopped it all. Um, and then, half a year later, oh, sorry, uh, actually the futility analysis was wrong. Um, so uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, present the data uh, on these first 50% of uh, cases uh, that uh, uh, that were included in the study, you know. Um, and, well, then uh, actually one of these studies were positive. Uh, one of them was negative, unfortunately, but one of them was positive. Really, really good. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, Biogen uh, submitted their application to, um, uh, to uh, the uh, FDA um, uh, to be reviewed for, uh, for use uh, in the U.S. Um, the FDA uh, gathered a committee of uh, uh, researchers and other stakeholders uh, who carefully scrutinized all of the evidence for and against um, the drug. And since these people you know, are trained in uh, Western medicine and they rely on randomized controlled trials, they voted against approval because the evidence was that, yeah, one of the studies was positive, one was negative. So it seems you know, like a, a very unclear situation. Um, if if uh, you know, if would you just go by randomized controlled trial paradigm, you know we could not approve this. But then, anyway, the FDA actually half a year later still approved use um, and went against its own expert committee um, when doing this. And this has been you know the source of an enormous debate in the U.S. Uh, um, uh, regarding this. What was actually the cause of FDA approving this and so on? Um, Anyway, in the U.S., there is uh, uh, so um, the mechanism is that the FDA can approve use in humans, but then there is another agency, the CMS, which is responsible for um, uh, reimbursement issues uh, for for drugs, and the CMS restricted financial coverage of uh, aducanumab to clinical trials because the CMS uh, said that oh, wait a minute, you guys did randomized controlled trials, and one of them was negative, and the other one was positive, so. You know, we don't really know if this works, so we are not going to pay for this. Um, and private insurance companies, they are sort of tied up with the CMS decisions. So this means that um, only people who can pay out of pocket, um, you know, about uh, yeah, several hundred thousand uh, Swedish uh, kroner every year, only those people uh, can, can now use this drug. Unless you are part of a clinical trial, because then um, uh, the, uh, the payment system will imburse uh, use of the drug. And um, actually what, uh, what uh, Biogen then did was that uh, they realized, okay, we're not getting away with this. Uh, we actually need to prove uh, that this thing works. Uh, so they started a new randomized control trial um, where they are enrolling uh, 1,300 patients. And this is a placebo controlled trial. Uh, so this is going to be sort of the decisive, conclusive trial. 
uh, to say if aducanumab worked or, or not. Um, and uh, this is very exciting, of course, but this uh, will take this uh, trial will take four years, so we will not know until 2026 if it uh, actually works or not. Unless they do a new fertility analysis, how <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> they will probably not do that because that was uh, you know someone someone had a very uh, tough uh, talk with their boss after that fertility analysis. <laughs> that was uh, not a good thing. Okay, uh, so so why did aducanumab maybe fail? Um, well, we've seen uh, versions of this image before here uh, during these talks. Um, those previous figures that we saw, they were based on sort of hypothetical curves. Here is one uh, which is data driven, so based on actual uh, data, um, with a time axis uh, uh, on the x axis, uh, sort of uh, a proxy for time indices of all summer seas, and different uh, uh, biomarker measures uh, reaching different levels of severity on the y axis. Um, so data seems to support this idea that um, CSF measures of beta amyloid move first, and this uh, is, um, so that's in the black line, and this is then followed, uh, actually very tightly coupled uh, by uh, amyloid PET in the yellow line and CSF P tau in the blue line. Um, and only later uh, comes changes in tau PET in red and cognition in, uh, in purple. Um, and we can, I think this is actually, this uh, tight connection here between amyloid and CSF p tau connects a little bit to one of Rubens' arguments, which maybe we'll come back to later. Um, now, most AD patients in clinical practice, they don't just have amyloid pathology, they also have widespread tau pathology. So patients with dementia and even mild symptoms typically have a lot of aggregated tau in their brain. Um, and there is a lot of evidence from observational data uh, that uh, A-beta pathology induces spread of tau pathology, and tau pathology is very closely related to cognitive decline. So maybe then, you know, intervening with A-beta pathology in these patients with a lot of tau um, could, would not be effective if tau pathology has sort of become uncoupled from A-beta and is now acting on its own, uh, causing uh, neurons to die and uh, uh, cognition to drop. And of course, the picture could be even much more complicated, right? Because Alzheimer's disease is so multifactorial. So you have um, effects of inflammation and gliosis and uh, you know, different resilience factors and uh, different co you know, other co-pathologies, vascular injuries and TDP43, et cetera, et cetera, all contributing to cognitive decline through pathways that are probably largely independent from beta amyloid. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're too late in the disease, uh, removing uh, beta amyloid from the brain could be like uh, fixing this bike uh, tire by removing this nail. It's probably not gonna work so well, uh, you know, uh, after just doing that to procedure. So maybe, you know, you need to think uh, a little bit uh, uh, differently here. Um, so when can we expect convincing effects of an anti beta treatment? Well, um, maybe if we start treating people with a beta pathology but who yet not have widespread tau pathology. Maybe then there is an opportunity to interfere with beta amyloid uh, before tau or the other downstream uh, effects become sort of uncoupled from a beta. Now, what is really important is that, you know, the biomarker, beta amyloid or tau or CSF, etc., it doesn't matter at all to the patients. They don't care about that. They care about uh, their cognition and their function. And that, all, that is also what societies care about. You know, the mm, Swedish taxpayers, they don't care about if uh, uh, we get rid of a lot of beta amyloid in the, in the head of people. They care about, you know, re reducing the need for, uh, for care and, uh, you know, for, for people needing assistance uh, in their homes. These things that are, you know, impact people's lives and is costly. So we really must stay focused on cognition and function as our outcomes and not just be driven by our assumptions that uh, no, beta amyloid probably causes everything, so if we just remove that, you know, um, it's good enough. Um, and another potential is, of course, that maybe just treating A-beta alone is not enough. Maybe you need to combine treatments against A-beta with treatments against tau, for example, especially if, if treating a patient in a later stage of the disease. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the end of... Uh, uh, you know, the uh, harsh truth. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Niklas. Uh, we can now
now go into the rebuttal. Uh, I don't know, Ruben, do you want slides or you? You mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. We can just yeah, stay seated. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't have. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's many exercises. <laughs> I, 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 I did have a, yeah. a, 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 one, 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 one exercise mm. that I could, could show. And I, we can yeah, put it up. You, we can just put it up if you want to, if you want to tell us. Uh, yeah, you, you can do that. So, so, uh, so it's... Uh, uh, so so the, 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 the last slide. I Perfect. Think that's that one. So thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation, Niklas. It's of course very... Uh, interesting at this point, and I must say that, that uh, there are of course two sides uh, to this, and, and there's also, uh, as you as you point out, that there's uh, the the part of of uh, the treatment being effective in uh, as a treatment for a better pathology, and I guess that, that we can probably agree. It seems to reduce uh, a better pathology in the brain, uh, but then, of course, so what? What, what, what do we? What, do we uh, what, what, should, what is this useful for? And, and uh, that is, of course, a very, very, very complex uh, problem because it also uh, it also uh, uh, what also comes into play is really what is the cost for it, and, and it seems uh, now that the cost. The last number I saw was 480,000 Swedish kroner a year per patient for, for this for this treatment, and that is of course uh, a very large sum to pay for for something that is uh, a bit doubtful when it comes to, to the clinical effect. Uh, what I wanted to show with the, with this uh, uh, data here is that that uh, e even though it's a beta amyloid treatment, that we do see effect on on uh, phosphor tau. Uh, one at one as well. They, they, they actually did a small tuppet sub-study uh, in, you can see this, the, the number, sorry, it's in, it's in total like 30, 37 people, uh, but still uh, there seems to be an effect, or at least uh, not as much, a, a slower, a, a slowering of, of, or lowering of the andral increase in tau, uh, tau pet load in these uh, 25 pers persons that have re received uh, the low and high dose uh, treatment in the regions of the brain where we know that tau, tau starts to accumulate. So I, th I think it, uh, that is at least uh, uh, relatively promising as well. That the, so even even though uh, there is uh, uh, even even though the, the, the treatment is directed against. Uh, Beta amyloid, with that there is still an effect on top that could that, that you could use to argue that that maybe maybe uh, it could be used even in the, in the later stages as well. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Ruben. Uh, maybe Nicholas, you want to say sure. something about that? Yeah, sure. I was thinking. So this is an interesting slide here, but yeah, the, so. It's uh, it's a bit odd, right, that they did this Taupet substudy in so few individuals. And they had like three thousand individuals in in engage and um, uh, or in in those two studies, uh, and they only had like uh, about thirty for this Taupet substudy. So that's uh, it is a bit interesting that they have not published more on, on effects on Taupet. I think, um, and uh, also this data here is not very transparent, right? So. With this small number of uh, cases, one would really want to make sure that there's not a lot of strong outliers uh, uh, driving some of these groups, for example. So, um, but but it, but still, I mean, yeah, it seems like we are a little bit uh, <laughs> not sticking to our uh, strong roles here. I mean, I also think this is interesting, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I can think in, maybe in conjunction with this, uh, we could open up my extra slides um, uh, to show... Everyone has to know. Yeah. <laughs> Which one you want? Let's just take this, uh, yeah, these cognition curves. Um, yeah. Um, so, so say now that, so I agree that, okay, we, uh, Adekanema probably works well to clear amyloid from the brain and potentially there is a slight uh, signal on, on tau, but let's just look a little bit at the evidence here for, you know, uh, for the cognitive effect. So what kind of cognitive effect can you expect? Um, so let's uh, look at the bottom row here, which is uh, change in MMSC, 
this uh, global measure of uh, cognition, which is routinely used in clinical practice. Um, um, in emerge to the left and engage to the right. You can see that uh, over the 78 uh, weeks uh, um, of study, so this is half the planned study, right? Because it was uh, uh, interrupted by the fertility analysis. Um, there is this average drop in placebo of about 3.5 points um, on, on the MMSC. And uh, uh, so that's an engage where there was no difference between placebo and treatment. And now let's look at the successful uh, study, EMERGE, which is on the left there. So the successful treatment was in the purple arm there, high dose treatment, where the difference is like, uh, yeah, what is it? It's like difficult to see from here even. It's like uh, the difference between minus 3 and minus 2.5 or something. Um, so yeah, the question is, is, is it worth to pay, as you said, uh, almost half a million Swedish kroner per year uh, to achieve this uh, uh, slow production of 0.5 uh, points on the MMSC scale, <laughs> and also at the cost of uh, uh, you know, <laughs> spending so much of your time uh, in clinics getting infusions with antibodies and uh, you know, this really occupying a large part of uh, of, uh, of your life uh, and that's sort of going to be the last part of your life also when you really need to think about you know how to prioritize your time and efforts uh, so yeah I wonder if that's sort of really a, a benefit that's uh, worthwhile um, it, you know even even if you have some reductions of tau um, but, yeah. okay thank you so much mm. uh, and I, I have a question but now we can open a thing for the for the audience <coughs> I would like, uh, if, if no one wants to take it, I would like to, to ask a question to both of you. Uh, maybe can, you know, help bring it, uh, bring everyone together a bit even more than, than this nice friendly debate, of mm -hmm. course. Um, many experts are talking about the fact that these large studies like Emerge, Engage, uh, over uh, 500 people in each, more or less, and they are not only providing good evidence or like um, important evidence about um, Adukanuma, but actually about how the pathology is working, of how treating the amyloid pathology is actually telling us. Mm -hmm. Not only with this, but also about Ari, as you mentioned, about this um, swelling and bleeding that accumulates in the brain from, with the brain from this, mm -hmm. from this uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your take? What, what do you think these data sets are, are telling us? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, I think it tells us quite a lot in, in the way. And now, if I if I move out of the uh, <laughs> proponent uh, part, so I would, I would say that I actually had as one of, one of my additional slides as well the, the 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 side effects of the treatment, and I think that's pretty interesting since uh, for general side effects like headache. Yeah, uh, Dissonance and those kinds of things. There, there are actually no big differences. The, the, the main difference is, uh, uh, is for uh, is the difference seen in, in the aria. Uh, that is sort of expected. You, we, we introduce an antibody that activates the immune system, and the, the immune reaction, I guess, leads to to uh, some sort of edema or, or activation that that, lead or that leads to edema, or an actually to, to microhemorrhages as well. And uh, I think that's really, now the majority of those seem to be uh, rather benign. So 75% uh, are really on the MRI findings, 25% were more, they had some symptoms related to them, and 3%, I think, were severe, uh, saying or saying, meaning that, that uh, patients had to be admitted to the hospital for the symptoms of the area. But no, there, there were no deaths related to, the, to this, uh, uh, this treatment. But still, uh, I think it becomes more, even more interesting because we, we say now that what we would like to do is to, to bring this into more an earlier uh, group of uh, participants that it would then be not no longer MCI or early dementia patients, but we, we would be like SCD patients or even controls. And then I guess the the uh, the then these uh, side effects become more more apparent and more difficult to deal with as well because then you would actually introduce uh, problems to someone who is who has no real cognitive issues and that might die to die for other reasons uh, uh, before they would actually develop symptoms of, of, of 
obviously. So it's it's really complicated mm -hmm. uh, issue. Uh, Thank you so much. I don't know if that answers your question. Could you put the poster? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I could. Let's come. Sure. Uh, yeah, I also think that these studies are super important and uh, very informative, um, of course, and uh, they give. Uh, yeah, they just give knowledge that cannot be uh, obtained in any other way, uh, really. Um, so, uh, just one example, it, it is really interesting to see what, what is the consequence of, of removing amyloid, because it seems like, so both aducanumab and, and other sort of uh, new generation of anti-amyloid uh, antibodies uh, are very effective in removing amyloid from the brain. Um, and um, even you know, even in situations where the outcomes on cognitions are not clear, it is really interesting to see what happens with uh, other measures of pathology. So, for example, I, um, Ruben showed this uh, reduction in, in CSF uh, uh, P tau uh, from treatment, and, and this has been shown also for other anti-amyloid uh, treatments that you, you remove uh, amyloid from the brain, it seems like soluble phospholipid tau levels also drop. Um, and that goes very well in hand with you know, our evidence and from other groups as well that um, changes in soluble phospholated tau are happen very closely aligned with uh, aggregation of amyloid. So it's super cool to see that if you remove this uh, amyloid aggregates, uh, you also have the expected change in soluble tau. It's not really clear to me though that that would translate into, you know, anything else downstream because it, it may be so that this increase in, in you know, soluble phospholated tau is just like a, an epiphenomenon of uh, amyloid pathology. It may not be that that sort of is a mechanistic link to downstream events in the disease. Uh, we don't really know that yet. Uh, yeah. but, but some of these things that we have seen in uh, observational studies, you know, can, you could, you could start uh, generating hypothesis, what would happen if you interfere with amyloid and you can see some of those uh, effects. Uh, so that's super important, um, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess we'll, nice. we'll know more in, in the in a few years. The the, the, the new Adrahelm study, if I understood it correctly, will will also incorporate tau tau mm. in the PET imaging. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why it's not a full reason, of course, but why tau PET was not included was that it started so so long ago in two thousand fifteen when tau PET was not really uh, like a thing, a, a yeah. well established yeah. uh, biomarker. For yeah. sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so the individuals that were included in this prime study, the first one, 166, have they been followed? Like how are they today? Are they included in many of the yeah, follow-up studies? They have, if I remember it correctly, been followed in an open extension mm. uh, type of, of set, uh, setting and have been followed clinically. and. Uh, there's some there's some effect, but it, but but it's not it's it's pretty similar to, to the effect seen here. But mm. it's also a very small group, so hundred sixty six in total, and out of those like a quarter placebo, and then. Right. Okay. But, um, but exactly, but they I guess they are not. Uh, yeah, you only follow the uh, one some active treatment, I suppose. Uh, yeah. So you don't really have you can't really test for. You know the effect of treatment versus placebo anymore. Um, that time. Any other questions? But yeah. Thank you for the interesting uh, discussion. Um, my question is a bit more on the preclinical side because a lot of the, the uh, anti oid trials worked in rodents, right? So both for clearing amyloid and in terms of their cognition. Mm. Um, but where do you think we're going wrong with how we're designing those studies in mice? Are they even the correct model? And if not, what like? useful preclinical work can we do to maybe help in the yeah. future translation at this stage that you're discussing? Yeah, super interesting uh, question. Probably many people here who wants to uh, weigh in on that. Uh, but um, um, you know, it seems like uh, there, there, has, there is a problem in general, right, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, predicting a positive clinical outcome in human uh, AD trials from uh, um, from these model systems, um, so what could we do to uh, yeah, to, to sort of uh, improve uh, uh, that translation? Um, I mean, maybe one aspect could be to sort of uh, try to uh, bridge more of these biomarker findings uh, into animals as well, um, 
because the, the you know the cognitive aspects or degeneration aspects is just so doesn't really translate that well, right? But uh, maybe start looking at the uh, the effects on uh, uh, on tau, for example, as well uh, from amyloid treatments, if possible. Um, do you have any other mm -hmm. suggestions? It's, it's a difficult it's a difficult question, but main, mainly because the the, the animal man, many animal models are, are a bit artificial in the way they're constructed. You you have a lifespan of two years for for a road, standard rodent, uh, and then you need to do something to make the, the, the that rodents develop disease. And usually that is done by overexpressing things. And, and uh, so if you, if you and the, the, then the problem is that if you if you counteract that overexpression, you'll basically revert back to a normal animal. So, so you would have to have some sort of um, combined uh, model that, that would, would have, a, a, not an independent, but still both amyloid and tau pathology. And then you could potentially remove the amyloid and see what happens to tau pathology. But still, it's, it's an artificial system, so it's, it's really difficult to design a good, a good model, uh, I'm afraid. Hmm. Yeah, that's really why we, I guess we, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so both uh, Ruben and I, of course, work with a lot with uh, biomarker studies in, in humans and uh, sort of feel that uh, uh, that is uh, um, an approach that maybe drug companies also could use uh, more. Um, um, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, saying against myself here, right, because uh, <laughs> in the end, we still need that uh, Real hardcore uh, effects on cognition uh, in humans uh, to motivate broad use, and that just uh, we don't really seem to have like a, a biological uh, marker that can well predict that <laughs> yet. Are there any like other models though that you'd be interested to be developed that could be more beneficial? Like which ones and why? Mm. Rodents, of course, is easy because of the genetic manipulation and they're relatively cheap, but you know. We are where we are. Yeah. Is it a time to start something new? Exactly. And under, I don't follow that much of the antibody, but anybody tested any of these therapies, in, for example, the DEMU model that has been established, or that's quite new. This the Chilean rodent, the DEMU model, this Chilean rodent that develops amyloid pathology spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Not aware of that. There's this model that develops the animal ages and develops spontaneously cognitive decline and mm. amyloid pathology. I don't know how it's all right. Yeah. Mm. That, that would be very, very interesting to have mm -hmm. uh, sort of a spontaneous model that that, that uh, doesn't, doesn't rely on, on mm. uh, overexpression necessarily. I think. Yeah. Uh, my guess is that, that also there are so many things that go awry in aged humans. It, it mm. seems to not to be only uh, not only overexpressing, but probably, probably also failure or breakdown systems of of, of, uh, of, of the cells as well. So so clearing of, of, of uh, faulty proteins. Maybe that could be like combining a, a, a ubiquitous proteasome system uh, deficient mice with with an uh, Alpha, uh, or not alpha, certainly. I'm low beta or tau overexpressing mouse to see what happens. <laughs> On the other hand, one could also, uh, you know, see that the so the first in in class uh, drug doesn't need to be perfect, right? So maybe in in reality, um, old humans have all of these different things that don't really work in the brain that contribute to cognitive decline. But the the first <coughs> drug that is approved wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't expect that to. Um, to fix the, the entire problem, right? Maybe it is enough that the first drug just does a little bit of nudge on that slope of cognitive decline because that's sort of a starting point. And in, you know, if one would see sort of 10, 20 years into the future, maybe we would have sort of an array of, uh, of different drugs targeting different age-related uh, deficiencies in the brain that only combined can sort of uh, uh, restore the slope. Um, so, so, and maybe it's just too much to ask for a model that uh, uh, can encapsulate all of that in one model. That, that's just uh, not really feasible, right? So. Yeah. Did you want to Several questions now? We have a few, actually. Do you want to go first? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question was related to you. Uh, because
because uh, one of the main points that I get from your presentation is that the cost of aducanumab is very high. But I would like to know your opinion if aducanumab cost will be like 1,000 crowns per year. Uh, should it change or not? Mm. And what do you think? Exactly. Actually, actually, just going to comment on that since mm. I think that's that's really the health economics is really a key issue here as well. Mm. If if it were if it would been it would have been uh, really cheap, then I guess uh, you could have started earlier on with a lower dose. Mm. Uh, even when people start accumulating amyloid, this it's sort of theoretically without knowing this. Uh, my assumption is that if you would start with the treatment early on. Uh, before the brain is full of amyloid, you're you're less you would be less likely to have a massive neuroinflammation, and then maybe you could start you could mm. treat that with a lower dose, and it, there's no real hurry in, in getting rid of the amyloid, but you could have a lower dose and give it for a longer period. But it still it still comes down to the, the side effects shouldn't be that bad, and, and the cost should be uh, managed in a mm. way. Mm. And I don't I don't know the exact exact price for it. I, I saw actually a calculation of a health, health eco economist who, who uh, made a statement when, when the FDA, uh, those Swedish health, health economists who made a statement when the FDA had approved, uh, uh, approved the drug and he said that well 480,000 is far too much, maybe it could be worth like 20 to 70,000 according to his calculations. Mm -hmm. And I guess if, if, you, if you had to pay 20,000 a year, yeah, maybe it would, would be worth it. I, I don't know what, what would be. <laughs> Right. I guess that's sort of based also on the uh, on the weak effect of the uh, yeah. of the drug, right? That it's just not worth more in terms of the its effect. Um, um, I was uh, thinking also that you know this um, uh, the idea of intervening quite early is supported by <coughs> results from another anti-amyloid uh, uh, drug, uh, donanumab, uh, where uh, they um, appear to show effects that sort of was correlated with. Uh, uh, with the tau load, so that the, there was like a sweet spot in people who were amyloid positive and just had sort of a, um, a, a minor or moderate amount of tau, they appear to be most uh, uh, responsive to uh, to the drug, and they are probably quite early in the disease. Then, so that sort of would also fit with this idea of uh, if you have something that is relatively safe and cheap, uh, so you could treat uh, a large number of individuals uh, quite early and treat them for a long time, then it would probably would both be worth it and also uh, you would have a better effect probably than <laughs> treating later so the the cost uh, econ sort of these yeah the cost benefit uh, uh, calculation would support it even more probably uh, if you treat uh, early yeah uh, what if we throw in uh, a men women uh, aspect into this uh, as uh, I think it was you uh, who found uh, that the uh, It's a very interesting question. I didn't see any any data on, mm -hmm. on the separation of uh, uh, on based on sexes in, in, in the in the uh, publication, uh, not even in the supplementary material. But uh, but um, it's of course a very important issue. Uh, mm -hmm. What we found was that it seems that tau the tau accumulation is faster in in the females than than in the males. But the amyloid acc accumulation is actually the same. Uh, and why we, why why that is, we, we don't really know. Uh, we still someone else would need to replicate the data as well. I, I heard from from another group uh, with a different cohort that they had seen the same thing in their in their cohort. But uh, I still haven't seen it published. So, so uh, but uh, of course uh, that needs to be taken into account as well, especially for the tau therapies. I would say, but. but uh, but I mean, if you assume that uh, the, the beta accumulation, that you need to stop it earlier, maybe in women, not to like uh, achieve this, uh, like when tau gets independently from a beta. Yeah, that, that's, that's very an, an interesting uh, uh, 
comment as well. I, I mean, maybe that, that, that could be the case that they, they mm. that the accumulation starts earlier on as well. Uh, it seems logical in a way, I, even though I don't, I don't know whether that's we don't, we, haven't, we don't know whether that's the case, but it seems uh, reasonable to, to think so at least. Mm. But there seems also to be, according for, uh, to the, the one you showed the slide from, from Philips' uh, data, where you showed the different biomarkers in there, mm -hmm. uh, where, where uh, uh, the phosphor or p and, and the uh, accumulated uh, or aggregated uh, amyloid were, were basically following one another. Mm -hmm. But there still seem to be a number of years, like, I don't know, if they're difficult to estimate from here, like five, five seven years before uh, M um, uh, the MTL mm -hmm. tile switch. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a couple of years at mm -hmm. least where, where you can, uh, where this could be a window of, of opportunity for. Exactly. I'm, I'm looking at the, through the supplementary material for the aducanumab uh, studies and there are some interesting um, forest plots actually, um, which uh, I mean, you, one could, you could dig into that uh, later, but to me it looks like uh, maybe the effect sort of, was, they start to find the effect by gender there. Um, and it, it looks like the, you know, there is overall trends for most of the outcomes that the effect is a little bit uh, stronger for men than for females, actually. Um, but they don't seem to comment on that in the text. But if we're just, just looking at the figures, that seems to be the case. Uh, maybe. So I could go well with that. We have a few, maybe we have for last three questions, maybe, uh, if you still have a bit of time to say, so let's take one, two, three. Okay, and yeah, you already mentioned that it would be would be like better effects if the treatment was uh, an earlier stage of the of the genesis. But what do you think it would be uh, like? It would be able to be applied as a as a preventional treatment, for instance, mm -hmm. in individuals who have a high a high risk position to have Alzheimer's disease, like mm -hmm. people with uh, with uh, Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be interesting to try it? Definitely, and uh, also in patients, of course, that carry sort of other autosomal dominant mutations uh, with uh, high risk of AD, and, and such trials are uh, being planned or already um, um, or have already started. Um, and in, in those sort of individuals that uh, where the subject level risk is very high, it seems very you know easy to motivate uh, such trials actually, but. Mm, and th those would be very important because they would sort of be proof of principle that, that it works uh, to prevent it very early. And uh, maybe even stopping them before amyloid accumulation occurs or sort of starting treatment um, uh, just as amyloid accumulation is starting. So you really sort of avoid downstream events. Um, um, but it's uh, more difficult perhaps to see that that would be sort of realistic uh, um, in, in the general population. Um, since uh, yeah, the, um, uh, it, it is so common with um, a sort of non-symptomatic amyloid pathology in the elderly um, and the, the duration, you know, the, the, the time that you spend in that stage is, can be very long and variable. Um, so that would mean that we would need to treat uh, hundreds of thousands of people probably with um, antibodies. Uh, with uh, unclear benefits, so but, but starting with the sort of proof of principle in these individuals with uh, strong genetic uh, risk for disease uh, seems uh, like a very good strategy to me. Uh, I wanted to ask because I know the AD patient group is very heterogeneous. So, like for example, AD genotype already could influence a lot. Do you think that aducanumab could work in a sub population of like? For example, if we pork carriers or certain lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think so. That, uh, for example, um, I'm not sure about this, yeah, the 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 effect of APOE there, but for example, a subgroup of people with uh, sort of uh, stratified by tau load would be would make sense uh, to me to make sure that you are having that you have like a the, you're targeting the disease in the most appropriate stage because that's the FDA. Uh, approved the drug, it was actually for Alzheimer's disease uh, in general, right? Um, so, without taking into account, you know, if it's very early stage or severe dementia, um, and that's uh, sort of very much goes against the consensus in, in the field around uh, uh, around the role of uh, amyloid. So that was surprising to a lot of people. But sort of uh, tailoring it to a subgroup of people with a 
distinct in a distinct stage of the disease uh, um, may be a good idea. Needed to check the supplement again because apparently it's the gender effect. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, it's there. Right? Yeah, it's on page 30 to 31. <laughs> <laughs> great. Actually, it's yeah, 32. The big journal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. The, 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 the question regarding uh, A, uh, A4 genotype is a bit difficult because they did something a bit strange in the design. Of, of the these studies, so they uh, they had different they had a high and low dose, and for ApoE4 carriers, uh, the high dose was comparable to the low dose in ApoE4 negatives, and then after a while they changed that, so you could actually get the high high dose in ApoE4 carriers as well if you uh, they, they made some kind of a protocol amendment. So it's it's a bit messy. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they seem to have been treated with different uh, amounts of, or different doses. So it's a bit difficult to really compare compare the groups because they've been treated differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems that that uh, aria is more common in the ABE4 group, and that was the reason for them keeping the, the doses down in, in that group. Uh, mm -hmm. So so it's yeah. So it's it's a bit it's a little bit difficult to answer. Bit of a different question. Uh, what do you think happened in those seven months at the FDA uh, <laughs> between November 2020 and June 2021? And uh, what what can that imply for us as scientific community for the future? Because uh, it, it's a bit worrying to me. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the sort of uh, so, so some people have even uh, you know accused uh, uh, different parts of uh, the FDA for you know corruption and so you know so so that it should be some really malignant behavior. But on one one could perhaps also view it sort of in the in the positive sense that through uh, over the last two decades there there has been you know accumulating evidence that uh, amyloid pathology is really uh, key for the disease uh, and uh, with this sort of um, when, when you have s sort of several studies that just miss uh, um, their target with uh, sort of they're just on the on the wrong side of the p-value for example there's there was this other study right the solenoizumab trials which uh, also had like a p-value of uh, um, 0.9 or uh, 0.09 or something like that so this is like this trends overall right that people kept getting but maybe there is something there um, um, so one you know doesn't need to reflect uh, real malicious behavior um, but uh, it's good with the checks and balance of the American system right that you have these uh, yeah. that you have like another um, uh, another um, authority within the government that could uh, sort of a little bit even out the odds uh, um, to make sure that uh, that yeah, we get a new I conclusive study. Either because, I mean, they could have kept doing a clinical trial without FDA approval because he engaged and emerged with a clinical trial. Um, right, but they wanted, uh, of course, FDA approval to be able to sell the drug uh, commercially. Yeah. Um, Which they want anyway. Yeah. Exactly, they won't yeah. now, but they, they, they gambled on that, no. right? They didn't, they didn't know that uh, when su submitting yeah, yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, application. Yeah. I mean, Aduhelm is, uh, Aduhelm is the commercial name of Aducanumab. Mm. It's, uh, is it, it's in some clinics in the, in the UN, like um, doctors are, mm. are prescribing it, right? So uh, it is not like uh, nothing happened, it's actually out there. So yeah. exactly, exactly. But uh, now, with uh, w when you need to pay out of pocket, uh, the number of patients who can afford that uh, is, of course, quite low. So yeah. probably, I think. But I read it's just a couple of hundred patients or so uh, yeah. in all of the U.S. that will be able to yeah, and, pay and themselves. So. Actually, to comment a bit on this, uh, um, Biogen, the company who started all this aducanumab study, are considering now to reduce by half the mm -hmm. price of the, we mentioned around fifty thousand U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to boost the sales, mm. uh, so let's see how that impacts uh, mm. clinics, right? Mm. Mm. Okay. It seems that the costs are not really corresponding to any, any true costs. <laughs> <laughs> no. Great, uh, I think we can uh, close this uh, first debate. Thank you so much, uh, Nicholas and Rupert, that was really great. Uh, thanks to everyone for the, 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 the questions.
questions and the engaging discussion. Um,